first a uh, small introduction to the company. Dement, previously William Dement, it was changed last year, is a market leader in hearing healthcare. We develop, manufacture, and sell products and equipment that help people with hearing loss connect and communicate with the world around them. We focus on four business activities, hearing devices, hearing implants, diagnostics, and communications. We are most known for our hearing aids, which accounts for around 85% of our business, and especially here in Denmark, most known for, and sometimes even known as, uh, one of our main brands, Odicon. We have our headquarters right here in Copenhagen, but our 50, 15,000 employees are spread all over the world with our two main production sites in Poland and in Mexico. So with that out of the way, we can get to talking about our hearing device configuration solution that we call EPDS. Now, before we started on the EPDS journey, and that was back uh, before 2014, our business suffered from a range of ailments. We had high data inconsistency and low data quality due to product data being maintained uh, locally in different system domains. We had inadequate support for complexity, scalability, and mass customization, something that we needed to get on par with our competitors. We had products with a few hundred variants at the time, and the system support for anything higher than that was unimaginable. We also suffered from inefficient communication channels and misinterpretation of orders received in wholesale and production. Um, as an example of how that could be, here is a real life example of a paper order form from Japan uh, at the time. This is how um, information was sometimes communicated. Uh, perhaps no surprise that our custom products experienced up to a 100% callback rate where the customer did not get what they ordered or production uh, could not build what was uh, requested. Frankly, we didn't take our master data management seriously and as a consequence, we did not have a solid basis on which to build um, our future product data solutions. What we needed was to get in control of our master data and get a strong master data management foundation going. We needed a central enterprise service solution for all our product master data needs. And we wanted that to have federation of data from our backend source systems. We also needed a common view on our hearing aid product variants, including a common language, common form of delivering communication, something that could support the entire value chain. In essence, we needed our single source of truth about product variant definitions. But before we got there, um, let me highlight a few of the key things that we did along the way to ensure that the solution would be a well-anchored su uh, success. It was all about getting the, getting the basics right. First of all, we needed to clean up our master our master data in our PLM and ERP systems and elsewhere. Otherwise, integrations, integration with those systems wouldn't work. So extensive cleanup started and we're still cleaning to, to this day. We also need to establish a common language framework for that master data. And to that end, we created the DMAN dictionary and we created an enterprise information model. The, the DMAT dictionary defines major business terms, notions, and phrases used in DMAT so that we all understand the same thing when we see the same word. Um, for instance, what, what do we mean by style and how is style different to product model when it comes to a hearing aid? The enterprise information model, and here's a snapshot of uh, just a little bit of it, is a representation of the demand business concepts, uh, the interpretation of these concepts and their relationships. The model provides shareable, stable, organized structure of information or knowledge in the context of the entire enterprise or specific business domains. That means that it holds the relevant business terms as in what do we call this thing, this product or abstract product development level, whatever it is that we want to talk about. It has the product variants which 
attributes do we use to describe the important parameters of our products and it has basic relations as in the hearing aid can be of the type BTE and BTE hearing aids connects to a hook and that hook connects to a tube and tubes connect to one of these earpiece types. So now that we had the basic building blocks in order, we can get busy building and modeling our solution um, on the top. So we call it EPDS, and that stands for Enterprise Product Data Services. EPDS is a suite of online services that provide a single source point for product master data at demand. To put that in another way, it's a solution that provides product variance information and inter-product relations and can share this information with other systems across the enterprise. Usage of EPDS includes um, R&D for obtaining their platform variants, sales systems for configuring new products, production for obtaining correct branding data at production order time, uh, quality for logging product complaints, as well as configuration validation for items in for service, product data for eShop catalogs, which tools will cover in greater detail, uh, manufacturing and service bills of materials for uh, our hearing aids, accessory overview and relation information in general of our products, and language and brand specific translations on all generic terms to name some of the use cases. We do um, regular weekly data releases on this every Monday morning. And we are currently at 20 subscribing systems who are all using our well-defined REST API to communicate with our configuration service. Uh, using EPDS, we get a single source of truth for our product master data thereby ensuring data consistency across our systems. We get the support for mass customization of our highly configurable products and solutions. We did a solution uh, count check uh, a while back. We were at roughly 280 octillion possible combinations. That's around 30 zeros or something. So good thing we have a configuration solution for that. We get faster deployment of our product data and as a consequence shorter time for that data to reach the last system out there and of course we get high overall data quality which leads to uh, reduction in order errors which leads to higher customer satisfaction and ultimately increased revenue if we go um, below deck for a moment here then at, at the core of our solution, we have our configured model, which holds around uh, holds around 1,000 attributes or feature families, as they may be known. Um, each of our attributes and each attribute value has a unique ID, which is used in our communication contract. We do not use names or fully qualified names for our feature string communication. So we can move attributes around and rename them all we want with no negative impact. It also enables us to communicate free of any language or brand context. So sending that order from Japan to Poland is no longer an issue. They can do the configuration in Japanese and it shows up in Polish at the production site. We model any relevant data for our subscribers that we cannot grab federate from one of our source systems and then we will actually also source and federate data from those systems too and then we tie it all together the outcome is a super system so to speak where you can do simple information queries or configure complete hearing solutions and where everything is linked together based on rule sets from the entire business and that enables us to use a single configurator model for all our business needs. This means, for example, that a sales order configuration is subject to the hardware platform rules defined by R&D, as well as the market restrictions from marketing, and that it will set the values and identify the components 
for the manufacturing bomb in production. All at the same time, different perspectives, but the same ultimate truth. So we have built the jet fighter and the hangar ship it sits on. So now it's time for somebody else to fuel it and arm it and take it somewhere. Yeah. Tools? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Jonas, and thank you for having us. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, as Jonas said, we built this amazing fighter jet. We've put a lot of technology, a lot of power, a lot of innovation into this. But right now, we don't really have any fuel, and we don't really have we don't have really armed it yet, uh, and we don't really have anywhere to go with it. So we kind of couldn't really figure that out. So this is where um, I kind of come in, and the PIM system and our team, my team comes in. So we took, we are the guys that commercialize our product mass data. So building on taking all this complexity and all this uh, work that has been done and figuring out how do we support uh, a consistent product journey across all our touch points. So this is kind of what we mean when we say we weaponize product mass data. Uh, so first of all, let's have a look at uh, what is PIM. So PIM is, uh, and we look say it's an iceberg. So what PIM is really, really good at is taking uh, information from uh, dump systems of so digital asset management from configurations from erp systems and federating all that together creating a solid foundation uh, on which we then uh, let marketing in and marketing then starts adding marketing descriptions uh, pictures enriching this product data to the point uh, where it's presentable in all our digital channels. So what what we are trying to do with our PIM system is take this vast amount of complexity, these 10 to the power of 10 with 38 zeros or 30 zeros behind, and boil it down to something simple and easy to use for our customers. And this has been a, a challenge because of business is challenging, and also we have to provide our customers with the same product experience, irregardless of the touch point they touch they come in on be it mobile apps, be it print materials, websites, e-commerce, it doesn't matter, it has to be the same story we tell across the board. So as it says, as Steve Jobs finally said, simplicity is the ultimate innovation and that's kind of what we aim for, saying, okay, simplify, 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 because ease of doing business is a parameter on which our customers look when they pick whose products to buy in the future. This is what PIM is. So what would it look like, or what did it look like, as you said, before we had our PIM system? Uh, and basically what you could see here is then we have multiple number of icebergs hanging around. We have tons of digital touch points. Let's press. Uh, and this is then what it looked like underneath. And carried information from, uh, we would get an Excel sheet from this guy, and then we merge it into here, and we get some information from EPDS uh, and our configuration engine and that would give us all the relations everything we need from there but we were missing marketing information pictures uh, digital assets pdfs and then the problem was then okay but then once you have that then that has to be carried into every single digital touch point manually so that's where we kind of put pim in said okay this is where pim goes put pim in in between and then we take it from uh, we took kind of took it from there so this is uh, what we say we call connected user experience. So our PIM system with provides product data at every single point in our user journey, from the point where we make them aware of our products, all the way to from product offerings on campaigns, on websites, on social media, all the way into our local and global websites, where we have translated content coming out of our PIM system so that the users see the same product experience in their local language. We have a, what we call a product tool, which allows you to compare, look at different product offerings. And this all builds on our PIM data, which is then underpinned by our master data and EPDS. We have a B2B commerce shop uh, where we also, where all the content is curated uh, out of PIM. We have tooling, we have apps, uh, and we are looking at, and we're also working with loyalty programs. All this, this entire user journey across the board from pre-sale to sale to after sales is all supported by our master data and our PIM system with, of course, a lot of, lot of involvement from, uh, from our, uh, our marketing department. Uh, this is just a sweet example of what our, so you remember the digital form that you want to show a minute or the paper form you showed a minute ago, you want to, 
this is the digital form of the same thing. So what we did here is, uh, if you look at it side by side, it's the same product curated in two different markets. So on the left, you have our uh, US, uh, or sorry, our UK shop, which is the same. Uh, all this you're seeing here, the pictures, the colors, come from PIM, and all the underlying attributes, battery size, or fitting level, or auto phone, all come from EPDS and master data and config. So what actually happens here is you click around, we actively go back, talk to config it. Config it answers back and says, hey, this is a valid combination. You can buy this or it comes back and says, nope, what you are trying to configure, we can't produce. And on the right side, you see the exact same order form localized into uh, Japanese in this case. And they have then decided there are some colors they don't sell and some, uh, both, uh, and some variants they don't want. So it's the same kind of power. We have the ability to have global master data, but to work with it in a local context. Uh, this is one example of what we do. Then another one is for our hearing, uh, our personal uh, communications brand, which is EPOS. Their entire website is built on product information uh, management. So from their PIM system, the entire content is curated uh, from PIM. So pictures, marketing texts, article numbers uh, in there, there PIM takes on a little bit of a different role, but they also use configurations to a large degree. And uh, just to say that uh, if I, last but not least, this is a printed technical data sheet for one of our products. Thanks to EPDS and the power of config, we can configure these and auto-generate this. There's nothing here that's manual anymore aside from the layout that's set in InDesign. You press a button and then we take our configured data, our master data, put on the, the marketing text, the benefits, the pictures, and then we auto-generate this entire technical, uh, what we call technical data sheet. This is automatic. There's no, uh, there's very little user involvement in this aside from setting up the layout and figuring out how do you uh, do this across the board. And the fact that we can do this means that this data can also be exposed on our websites and to our users and to our uh, professional customers that they can compare our products. So we're actually providing a unified product experience and they will see the same text that you see here will be available on the website as well. And uh, last but not least, of course, as we've said before, uh, we've done this in cooperation with, config, uh, with Configured as the underlying, uh, as the underlying uh, platform and Solution Space has been the implementation partner. On the PIM side, we are using InRiver and our uh, implementation partner on that side is EMEO, one of the leading partners in Northern Europe. And uh, of course, we ourselves have thrown a lot of resources at it as well and been part of this journey. And this has been, what we have achieved so far is great, but we're not done. There's more to do, there's more to experience, there's more to develop on this. Uh, and I think we've just scratched, uh, we, we've reached a good point, a good uh, what's called level point where we can stay but now it's uh, to, to try to time to delight the business. How long did it need to go from go from the setup to go live? I might uh, answer that one. Uh, I was the lead architect on the configured modeling and the master data side. Uh, and uh, we started out in 2014, giving a deadline of being able to deliver the first master data for the ERP rollout implementation was called Atlas. And within four months, we were delivering the first data for the um, for the ERP implementation. Of course, that was not this setup you saw here. But we delivered the first master data where we had started up cleaning up, and some of the data was hand carried and so on. And then we have been using agile approach, the skateboard model, where we are adding on the top. And now six years after, we are more or less as this picture, and then. We continue to develop new functionality, expand it in the platform, and so on. But without four months, we were able to deliver the first data. Well, we can say from the point where we created our decided to have a PIM system to the point where we had our first POC live was approximately six months. Uh, so, but that mean also meant that we had a, the master data foundation there already. So we were not starting from scratch. In retrospect, would you implement PIM and EPDS at the same time if you were to do this again? Uh, I'm guessing this one's for you, Tor. <laughs> I would not do it at the same time again. Uh, this has been 
the, the fact that you're developing two such core systems at the same time means that we have had a lot of uh, duplicate functionality. It, it created in one system, which we then had to decommission to move over to one of the other ones. Um, you could do it, but I would clear, create very, very clear cutoff. Like you need a very good scope on saying, okay, when do when does EPDS stop and when do does in river begin? Uh, and I don't think we had that in the beginning, so there's a lot of back and forth. What lessons have you learned? What would you do different if you were asked to do this project again? I can pitch in uh, the uh, the master data management discipline uh, has uh, proved and and keeps proving to be a very very hard one. It requires uh, it requires uh, a proper mandate and. Uh, and, uh, and 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 continuous backing from 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 management. Uh, it needs to be a strategic decision that you want to go this way. And um, though we are reaping the benefits of having a good foundation uh, now in those uh, twenty some systems, um, we have to keep being vigilant because it it it, it does kind of erode over time or it's, it slips a little bit if we're not paying paying attention. Um, so it, it so it's a it's a it's a const, constant work just to to sort of uh, uh, keep keep where we're at and and not and not drift drift back. It says uh, while defining product master data, what is the criteria or what was the criteria? And what is master data for you and what is not? Well, master data, of course, is uh, is is many things. So we're focusing on product master data. And um, we did have some some goals of being able to deliver specific information to uh, our sales systems. So that's kind of the uh, that was kind of the goal when we started out and what was covered in the in the in the first amount of, of, of months. So we we have focused on on whatever has been something that was needed by our customers, and we need to be in control of uh, of anything that sort of created created. Uh, uh, Variants, so any any anything where we had our that that would be different from 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 product to product. It's what we've been focusing on. I can see towards you yeah. have uh, something to say here. This too. Is, but this is actually a very good question because when does product? Because I sit right in the cross, like in the intersection between the business and master data. So when does master data stop? When does it stop being product master data? And when does it start being marketing master data? Does that make like? Uh, this, Kind of what discussion, and I think that's an ongoing discussion we're having, is that when when does master data let go and say, okay, now we commercialize this, so now we need to kind of give it a little more lead, a little more wiggle room. You have a request of yours? No, no, it's just that <laughs> even though um, in this that we this presentation didn't didn't take long, of course the 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 journey has uh, taken uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, Blood, sweat, and, and and tears, and a lot of work has been going into defining actually the answer to 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 that very question. So so data in the organization has been divided up into transactional data and product master data and customer master data and uh, metadata. So we do have a lot of data categories, but they, I can't give the exact uh, definition. Just that we. we 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 uh, we do have those for what we consider product master data. How many people were in the core team? Um, I think we're around twelve people in the EPDS core team at the moment. Um, we have uh, people um, maintaining and developing the solution uh, um, on the on the uh, technical side, so programmers, developers, and we have business consultants on the functional side. And then we have a couple of people running the, the data releases. But um, but those are the 100% dedicated resources. We have a lot of people around that as well who are supporting, who are maintaining our enterprise information model or our are um, aiding us uh, some uh, uh, enterprise architects who make sure that the that whatever we want to solve that it that it it gets solved the right system. So the PIM team, which is a lot more than PIM these days, consists. We are in the core. We're about seven people total. Uh, 
which are consists of me, uh, an architect, a team lead, and then some developers. And then I have a lot of uh, F dedicated resources and a lot of people that are extensions of my team in sales marketing, where I spend the majority of my time. Maybe, uh, yes, but maybe you can talk about uh, the size of the team from from beginning to now. From the beginning, we were quite fast uh, setting up uh, with around four developers uh, developing the platform and around three and four functional people uh, and making sure to develop and, and create and, and clean up and the master data. And then we, as, as, as uh, you told said, there was also people on the side uh, working half time on, on very much from the Innovia PLM part, uh, cleaning up data. Uh, so, so, and one of the success was we definitely were managed to have dedicated people uh, in the project, uh, a very dedicated project manager. Uh, and, and another thing was that we were forced to deliver data as we've been forced to deliver data quickly. So the, the, company could see the benefit of having these kind of solutions so they kept funding it because it's always a challenge uh, and then also um, we learned as we go so this whole uh, agile approach that was definitely also some of the learnings I will take out of this that yes do it we, we don't sit and think don't implement and work out for, for several years and then do a big bang implementation try out learn fast fix it and come on and move on yeah. Get to value quickly. Yeah. Yes. How many years did you spend on this journey until present day? Uh, we've been on the PIM journey for about five years now. Uh, and I've been on it specifically for four years. And yeah, it, yeah it's, it's about the same. difficult to estimate the, the man years that, that we spend on it. But uh, EPS started back in 2014 and heard about how many team members we were. Some were 100% alloca allocated to the project, and then we have resources of a varying percentage. So I don't, I don't have the number, but it's significant. The uh, si size of the core team has, has increased is also that we do more and more operation on, uh, operational work on, on, on what, we've, what we've created. So now it's more getting data through the systems and less on creating something, creating something new. I also think that and though five years sounds like a long time for any project, but it's also, as Jesper said, it's very much, we've always said it's taken an MVP approach to this. So it's very much uh, deliver business value, deliver it fast, and then build on top of that all the time. So it's not like we, we say, okay, we've been spending five years of development. We've spent six months in on, on my case, and then we were live, and then we constantly built from there. How do you handle the master data now? And do you have a master data department? Well, we we do. We do have a master data department. So, um, and we have, um, in that we have sort of uh, two groups of people. Um, one, uh, one group is concerned with the actual operational work of our core master data, uh, uh, getting it through the, through the systems. So they will typically have a specific system that's theirs and then they handle whatever master data flows in and out of that. They're responsible for that. Um, the other uh, group in, in master data management handles uh, uh, governance, uh, develops policies, uh, and, and uh, is more on the, on, the, on the master data management discipline that they're involved. I can maybe add on to that, Jonas, when you say master data disciplines and policies and so on. One of the successes for this project has been that, that in the beginning, the master data, uh, we had a huge communication task and, and, and go out and influence um, the organization to say, this is important. So we created what we call master guidelines uh, that was easy to communicate and to understand. Uh, and, and, and from having a little bit resistance in the years back to now that, that when we go in and create new products and we discuss it, there's a more acceptance that, that master data is important because if we don't have consistent master data, it's not possible to have it free flow more or less automatically out to all the consuming systems. So the, the, it has 
changed a little bit. We are still fighting a little bit, but, but it has changed over the years. What are you using for building product configuration? And how are you handling variants for different geographies? We're using a configured model as we're still, um, still on. And um, in that we model all variations that are um, globally uh, available, so kind of the, the, the gross solution, solution space. And then we, have, um, then we have solutions built on top that can restrict that uh, that global whatever is available uh, globally, and, um, and and then we put restrictions in for the for the different uh, markets tools. Yeah, actually, uh, so you build for globally. I, I my systems handle locally. So actually, we use our PIM system and some of the applications we built on top of that, specifically assortment management, to limit the solutions uh, the the solution space you're working within. So it's actually once you, it's built and modeled, it's globally available. And then we have a tool where we go in and say what is available within this specific market in this wholesale company to this customer. Um, that's kind of how we handle it. Yeah, and the assortment management tool is uh, is actually a nice, very nice tool. It's built on in River, but it utilizes configured technology. Yep. Uh, so this is actually a very merged uh, application, uh, merging with these two different technologies, uh, but very powerful as, as the model we have created in configured is a global, is one unit, but it's only one configured model. Uh, and then um, on top of that, we put the different assortment restrictions. You mentioned something around 10 to the power of 30-ish product variants in your models. Can you confirm this number? And how can you process with such a large variant space? Does right. that question make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, when you when you start multiplying your attributes and the different values that you can select within those attributes, the number grows very, very, very fast. And uh, so, so the number I mentioned, it 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 wasn't cheating, but um, for example, so our our um, if you pick any specific hearing aid that we have, um, then we may have. 40,000 different combinations of any one model of hearing aid. There is a, a number of colors you can choose, a number of uh, fitting levels uh, for, for each color. There are some different different uh, price points and different uh, levels that give you different functionalities. You can choose to have your hearing aid with or without a telecoil, with or without Bluetooth, with or without a lot of stuff. So that number quickly go, grows and you allow it at 40,000. Um, but our solution, is a uh, as I mentioned is is this super system. So we have all we have modeled all the accessories, for instance, inside the same thing. So so it's one of these forty thousand hearing aid combinations, and then you can choose between ten different remote controls, and you can choose between different TV adapters and remote microphones and all different kinds of accessories. And that is why the number gets gets so big. So we don't try to print it out in, in Excel, but we can, we can handle any query that is sent to EPDS and we'll have the answer for you in less than 200 milliseconds. And in the hearing aid business industry, each company normally launch a new product model each half year. And each product model has a variance of, of different styles. Mm -hmm. So the EPDS model today almost goes product model program goes 20 years back. So that's also one of the things. So if you look at one generation of a hearing aid, the, the number is limited and a lot, but we go 20 years, more, almost 20 years back on the product model program. Yeah. Some, of, some of the, uh, some countries still sell products that we would consider older products, but uh, it's also the case in our, in our business that there are there are uh, long service periods where we still have to yeah. to make the products uh, available for service, and the service scenarios they use EPDS for ver verifying the configuration. So we keep we keep it all in there until it until it goes completely obsolete globally. In what way are your activities in MDM affecting medical device regulations? How might this differ across regions? 
it uh, it definitely impacts uh, um, what we're doing or what we can do. Um, I don't think I can give you any specifics, but it's certainly in, increased dramatically in in the uh, in the last uh, couple of years. So it is giving us uh, some great uh, great challenges. But I wouldn't say that we are affected more because we have because we are that much in control of our master data, master data system and our product configurations. That's that's I don't think that's related. Yeah. The, the regulatory uh, part of this that comes in in terms of uh, the yeah, if notifying bodies, if, uh, FDA or whatever they are called, it doesn't really it it really only it, it really hits on the commercial side. So when we start claiming things, saying things, that's when we have to be very aware. Uh, of course, MDM is affected. Uh, I think our sales marketing departments and our commercial side of the business is uh, even more heavily regulated. So what is the most common use uh, case of data cleansing and what approach did you take to clean it up? I'm not sure if I completely understand the, uh, uh, the, the question, but uh, where, we, where, we, where we did need to do a lot of cleanup was in these uh, source systems where we, 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 we model enough so that we can do a, a matching that enables us to get Grab the right data, for instance. Grab the grab the proper product number uh, from our PLM system, and bring that product number description and some other data uh, to us and include it in the in the solution. Um, and with the very very strict rule sets that we have implemented in EPDS, we knew the exact variants uh, that we had to uh, that 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 we had and that we would have to be in control of. So we 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 knew what to expect. When we're interfacing with that other system, and then it's well, it's uh, it's, it's a lot more work than it sounds like. But then it's really to see how much do we get, and then go and look for what we're not getting, and why aren't we getting getting it, and then and then basically uh, uh, fixing that by 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 uh, by by changing the values or inserting the inserting the right values, because because this master data management has been a Proper discipline. You, you, uh, we would experience that the, the 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 format or the convention of of how things were named or how things were tagged would change every year. So so we were looking into a lot of different ways of of of, of, of how this data was maintained. And now it's now it's all aligned or at least getting there. I can see tools you had some comments there. Yeah, uh, I was just want to add that it's the I, I know this is not necessarily data cleanup, but it is a part of the journey that uh, we are also trying to as we it automate more and more of our marketing and sales stuff. We are also dependent on the master data being correct. And what we are seeing is that we also and that's part of the change management is that when you put structure into these systems and you use master data and you hit a uh, commercial side of the business that is used to more freedom all of a sudden in order for data and information and assets and stuff to flow correctly they need to adapt to a new structure and there has been a bit of cleanup on the on the commercial side and it, i think it's a still a journey that we're on in some cases to, to kind of get our sales marketing department to understand that if you want to automate this then there are processes and foundations and principles you need to follow otherwise we can't get this common this flow to run correctly. Yeah. So, so the effort has been in 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 sprints, and also it's a continuous effort. And, and a little bit to the approach, um, we did it uh, very much attribute by attribute, um, and we said from the beginning that we will go ten years back, and that was we were able to expose in the system, but we didn't do it by model year by model year. Because that was more or less important. So we had a, in the beginning we had a lot of what we call matching rules, where we in our matching system we we had a lot of transformation rules that say, okay, in this system it's called this, in our EPDS system it is called that, and then we have some mapping tables and all that. And then I will say we have removed 60, 
70 percent of these uh, matching rules and we are still having 30 to go yeah so 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 we got by by making complex matching rules that yeah. would that would make this data match and then later on we could go in and actually clean it up properly so we could do simple one-to-one -one matching between the data 